first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a human being, the resurrection of the dead also came through a human being. For just as in Adam all die, so too in Christ shall all be brought to life, but each one in proper order. Christ the first fruits, then at his coming those who belong to Christ, then comes the end, when he hands over the kingdom to his God, to his God and Father, when he has destroyed every sovereignty and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. For he subjected everything under his feet. But when he says that everything has been subjected, it is clear that it excludes the one who subjected everything to him. When everything is subjected to him, then the Son himself also will be subjected to the one who subjected everything to him, so that God may be all in all. Otherwise, what will people accomplish by having themselves baptized for the dead? If, not, if the dead are not raised at all, then why are they having themselves baptized for them? Moreover, why are we endangering ourselves all the time? Every day I face death. I swear it by the pride in you brothers and sisters that I have in Christ Jesus our Lord. If at Ephesus I fought with beasts, so to speak, what benefit was it to me? If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Do not be led astray. Bad company corrupts good morals. Becoming sober as you ought, and stop sinning. For some have no knowledge of God. I say this to your shame. Praise be to God always. Of your coming and the end of this age. 
Jesus said to them in reply, See that no one deceives you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am the Messiah. And they will deceive many. You will hear of wars and reports of wars, and see that you are not alarmed, for these things must happen, but it will not yet be the end. Nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and earthquakes from place to place. All these things are the beginning of the labor pains. Then they shall hand you over to persecution, and they will kill you. You will be hated by all nations because of my name. And then many will be led into sin, and they will betray, and they will hate one another. Many false prophets shall arise, and they shall deceive many. And because of the increase of evil doing and sin, the love of many will grow cold. But the one who perseveres to the end shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached throughout the whole world as a witness to all nations. And then the end shall come. This is the truth. Peace be with you. Praise and blessings to Jesus Christ, our Lord and God. Lord, give me us His words of God. Praise and blessings to Jesus Christ, our Lord and God. <coughs> When all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself shall be subjected to him that put all things under him, so that God may be all things in all. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. The Gospel is about presence. And often I've pointed out to you that the word that St. Paul uses when he speaks about our Lord, often we refer to it as the second coming. That he uses the term actually not of second coming, he doesn't call it that. He calls it the parousia, the appearance, the manifestation. And it's an important point because oftentimes Christianity is often characterized, almost like a cartoon sometimes. Jesus is born, we celebrate Christmas, Jesus is betrayed, he dies on the cross, Jesus walks out of a cave, and Jesus soars into heaven. And if you're good, you'll get a ticket, and you get to go someplace really nice after you're dead. That is not Christianity, that's absence. Never in the Catholic Church has the vision of the ascension been that Jesus was leaving us. The Catholic Church has always been aware of presence. Indeed, it's the reason why we come every Sunday to return to this point of presence of our Lord's triumph and His resurrection. It's why we have this serious obligation to be part of that weekly celebration. We celebrate presence. God is present within His church. It's why we call it the mystical body of Christ. It is the body of Christ. It is present. Christ is present on earth in His church. Christ is present in the consecrated baptized and especially those who are in the state of grace, the living reality of that presence within them. And Christ is also obviously present within the divine mysteries, that moment and that touch of the hand of God in the divine transformation of the mysteries, specifically, truly, centrally, up on the altar in the divine sacrifice, our Lord's death and resurrection. Again, presence. Not a memorial of an absent historical event 2,000 years ago, but the presence of that reality here and now. And of course, within the Eucharist itself, our Lord's substantial presence, body, blood, soul, divinity, really, truly, and substantially present. 
Catholicism has always been about presence. The day of the ascension is our Lord's glorification and his entrance into his divine glory and his personal reality. But it's a promise to us of our future glorification. It's not that he leaves us. And so the importance is the realization of presence. Our daily prayers, morning, evening, are about presence. I place myself before the hidden God. And I ask for the things that I need, of course, but I primarily, in adoration and thanksgiving for that presence, ask God to speak to me and to guide me. It's about presence. And the idea then is that that presence is from generation to generation in this movement. Ultimately a vision of triumph and glory. If you read St. Paul's letter to the Ephesians, he portrays this presence, St. Paul portrays this presence as our Lord in the triumphal parade. Many of you are aware of the fact that in the Roman Empire, in the, in the Forum, in the Roman Forum, at one end with the Arch of Titus, and the other end the Temple of Jupiter, triumphal generals coming back from war would have these military parades. No ticker tape, but the same idea. And they would bring in the last, at the end would be the general dressed as a god, Jupiter. And they would go up and they would have sacrificed the Temple of Jupiter. But this military parade brought captives in chains, bonds, dragging them in as the end of the parade in that triumph. St. Paul uses that image of our Lord's triumphant, glorious resurrection, that he drags the powers of darkness behind him. And that triumphant movement is from generation to generation until the day that our Lord decides to show this presence to everyone believers and unbelievers. And that is what we refer to as being the second coming. I mean, it's not a new coming, but it is a second coming in the sense that it will be manifestation to everyone. During the days of the resurrection when our Lord was still here on earth, physically, He appears only to believers. He doesn't appear to the priests in the temple. He doesn't appear to any of those who have betrayed him. He appears only to those who were disposed and who believed. And that reality continues until that day that he decides that full manifestation of his presence, parousia. And it's because of that manifestation of presence that will take place in glory, time will end. Again, it's a characterization of this idea of we have this long absence Behave yourself, get your ticket to that happy place, and then we wait for all hell to break loose, the Antichrist appears, and then Jesus comes in triumphant. That is not really the vision of the scriptures. The reason for all the convulsions of the cosmos and the sun and the moon going dark and the moon turning red, those things are showing that the world in convulsions not being able to receive this divine presence because it's wounded by original sin. It's not because God decides he's going to make all happy break loose. It's because of the lack of receptivity of the cosmos itself because it's affected by sin. Which is the reason why in the Gospel of St. Matthew, our Lord talks about it as being labor pains, howling in your delivery room, because of the agony of this, but life is entering the world. That's why our Lord uses on several occasions this image of birthing. And so this presence is something that we have to be aware of here and now. And that's what St. Paul is dealing with in this letter to the Corinthians. The Corinthians, of course, are our Greeks. And they like high you know, philosophy. So the idea of the resurrection for them is that it is spiritual news spiritual new life. Of course, for the Semitic people, for St. Paul and for the Jews, they understand very well the resurrection is the resurrection of this body. Rising in glory because of the transformation of Christ's presence within that life. But the Greeks, 
For them, culturally, the body, material things, the dirty. Which is why the pagans, the Greeks, the Hindus, the Romans, they burn bodies. They burn bodies not to dispose of them, because for them, religiously and philosophically, it's a rite of purification to get rid of that dirt. Which is why Jews and Christians have always buried bodies, because we wait, they sleep. They repose in peace until that day of the manifestation. So what are happening in Corinth is the people are like saying, well, the resurrection's already taken place. It's our baptism. It's our spiritual life. And always trying to make Christianity something ethereal, airy-fairy, some kind of story that's spiritual. You hear it all the time these days. It's the, one of the latest slogans we have in the human race. Well, I'm spiritual, but I'm just not religious. Which means essentially, and I'll make it up as I go along. But the Greeks were doing their same version of this in Corinth. And that's what St. Paul is dealing with at the end of this first letter. It's chapter 15, and as always, I encourage you to read this chapter. And he says to them, if Christ is not really risen from the dead, if this resurrection is not a reality here, then he says that we're the most depressed and most miserable of all men. Because what are we doing then? Why am I writing you this letter? What does it all mean? It's just a fairy tale. And that's why he writes this letter saying, but no, Christ is now risen truly from the dead, is now risen from the dead, and he is the first fruits of them that sleep. The dead have not risen yet, and it's not a spiritual thing that we're trying to make up in the air. And he uses this term when he says first fruits. The term in the Greek is arabon. Arabon is a term which literally means, refers to the first sheaf of your harvest. The notion of tithing, we give 10%. The Lord God gives us everything, of course, including the life that we live. The idea of tithing is that we return 10%. We keep the other 90%. Well, the government takes a big chunk. But we give 10% of this whole back to God because that consecration of the 10% consecrates the whole 90. And that's why St. Paul says, Our Lord, the ascension, the resurrection, this is Arabo. Our Lord, as the new Adam, is transfigured and transformed in glory as Arabo, as the first fruits. So that the rest of the human race of those who believe are also consecrated and will enter into that same resurrection. So the term that he's using is it's a first installment. It's a down payment. Remember we used to have layaway programs? That is our Lord. And St. Paul is saying this resurrection reality is for all of us. And it will come. And it will be this body that will be transformed for those who believe. Because that first installment, that down payment, that promise, that first fruit of the resurrection is for those who are to be freely choosing to enter it. God made the human race free. We can choose to approach our Lord, or we can choose to stay away. When we choose to stay away, we choose to die. Because the life that God has manifested is manifested in the resurrection. And that's why if you look at the prayers that we have also in the Expo, in the Wusoyo and the Red Books here, you'll notice that what the grace we ask for specifically is that you give us strength as we proceed to our death. <clears throat> it's presence, not absence. <clears throat> Our Lord did, God did not enter into time. Our Lord did not enter into history to take away pain. That's pretty clear. He did not enter into this world to make life easier. That's also very clear. We're the same human beings with the same problems we've had throughout the whole history of the human race. 
He did not come to trans he did not come to take away pain and suffering. But by his death on Calvary and his resurrection, what he came to do is to be present in that suffering. It doesn't take it away, it doesn't make it easier, but it gives it a meaning and a reason. And that presence of grace and that presence of the divinity within that suffering, in those disappointments, in those discouragements, in that depression, in these disappointments of life in general, and of course the physical ailments. Christ is meant to be present by this power of the resurrection. And this is that transformation of leading all things to that great moment of our Lord's appearance. As I said to you, throughout this whole season of the exaltation of the cross for these seven weeks, we are going to consider death, judgment, the end of the world. That's what this season is for. And what the reminder of St. Paul today is, is about that death itself is not something that is definitive finishing. Because there is presence also in that death of the resurrection for those who believe. Note our anaphoras that all the times that we pray for the dead of those who have gone to their rest hoping in you. But that means that on the day of their death they were hoping in Christ. Not that they just died. It's presence. And that presence is what we tap into in our prayers, as I said, and in the mysteries. Which is why this presence of our Lord, St. Paul, then says towards the end of this section of chapter 15, he says, now awake, get up, you just. Do not sin any longer. Sin are all these detours. Some of them are complete acts of suicide. But sin in general is a detour. You're moving away from that presence of life and resurrection. And he says, awake you just. Come to your right mind, sometimes it's translated. And no longer sin, focus on this presence and be transformed. He says, because some of you do not have the knowledge of God. Now this is horrible. Because he's writing to people who are baptized who are supposed to be catechized, who are supposed to know that presence and that reality. And in the Semitic idea of knowledge, it means experience. It's not cerebral. So when he says to them, get wake, you just, you've been consecrated, you've been baptized, and do not, do not sin any longer. Sadly, some of you have no experience of God. And he says, but I say this to your shame, to wake them up. No parent likes disciplining their children. No parent likes insisting in having these evening battles over eat your peas. But you know that they have to do more than just eat candy and drink soda. This is the kind of shake up, this is the end of the letter to the Corinthians. Remember we told you that Corinth was a difficult parish for St. Paul. And so in the last moment he's trying to say, look to the presence, understand the transformation of life and resurrection that is among you, and experience this knowledge, this knowledge of God, and it will keep you on track. Which is why we say, participating in the mysteries, our daily prayers are all necessary, otherwise we stop breathing in the supernatural order, and when we stop breathing, we suffocate, and we die. Not to be overly dramatic, it's logic. And so as I said, the Gospel is about presence. It is about life, it is about resurrection, and it is about victory. And we choose to follow in that triumphal procession to the day of the manifestation, the parousia of that presence to all mankind. But it is a great moment for us, during these weeks of the cross, to turn towards the Lord and to ask Him to give us this grace so that we ourselves may come to this experience of the power and the presence, not just simply on Sunday morning,
with each day of our lives, and that presence be the consolation within our sufferings, our pains, and our difficulties in this valley of tears. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit.
shall we be spiritual blessings upon them in place of their earthly gifts, grant them life and your kingdom.
you sent your only Son to save us, for we are weak and poor. When we win to strength, brought us back to your spiritual call by his royal blood. Through your grace and the favor of your only Son, we implore you to accept this bloodless sacrifice from our sinful hands, and through it to forgive our sins. We glorify and honor you, your only Son, and your Holy Spirit, now and forever.
fashioned earth and baptism, your saving passion, and life giving death, your burial, your glorious resurrection, and ascension into heaven, your sitting at the right hand of God the Father, and your royal second coming when you will judge all people and reward them according to their deeds. Now we ask you, at that fearful hour, at compassion on us and have mercy on us in your kindness, and forgive our sins in your mercy. For this your church and fortune, and through you and with you and Lord your Father saved.
have the courage to follow your will. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord, upon this altar and upon your heavenly altar, the holy and ever-Virgin Mary, Mother of God, the prophets, apostles, martyrs, confessors, and evangelists, John the Baptist, the forerunner, Stephen, the archdeacon and first martyr, St. Joseph, St. Jude, St. Mary, St. Charlotte, and all the saints. May we join in their ranks and share in their joyful feast. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord, the faithful teachers who have gone to their rest in the true faith, especially Peter and Paul, Mark, Clement, Ignatius, Dionysus, Julius, and all those who endured suffering and persecution for the strengthening of your holy church. Remember also those who serve your holy altar and forgive their sins, that they may reach your joyful dwellings. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy.
Grant us your mercy through Christ Jesus our Lord, for you are blessed and glorified with him and with your Holy Spirit now and forever. Amen. Peace.